Welcome to Education Forum. I'm Herman Badillo, Vice Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the City University. The improvement of education affects all New Yorkers. This program will focus on the key educational issues and challenges before us all. My guest today is the Reverend Dr. Floyd Flake, who is the senior pastor of the African American Methodist Episcopal Church in Queens. It's uh, one of the largest uh, churches in New York City with over 10,000 parishioners. Uh, Dr. Flake has a doctorate of ministry degree from Union the Theological Seminary in Dayton, Ohio. He has been the director of the Martin Luther King uh, Afro-American Center at Boston University and the Dean of Students at an university chaplain at Boston University. He also has been a member of Congress. He served in Congress from 1986 to uh, 1997 when he resigned. Right. Uh, but of course, I could talk to you, you led almost as many lives as I have, I could talk to you about a lot of things, but this program has to do with uh, education. So we're going to be talking about uh, your activities in the field of education, and we are particularly interested in the fact that you have had a, uh, a school as part of your church right. for many, many years. Tell us about that. Well, we started um, 1976 when I came out of uh, uh, BU as, as from being dean of students there. One of the things I had noticed was that many of our students came out of some urban communities and did not have the skills for real competition. We developed programs on campus to meet those needs, but I felt that if I could get kids in pre-K or first grade, take them through eight grades of education, then the probability was that they would be better prepared for college, even if they didn't go to a great high school. So we came and um, uh, asked the congregation if they'd like to be involved in education, uh, the building of a school. We built a school and opened in 1982. And today... How many uh, students do you have? We, we have 480 kids, generally. We can go up to 500, depending on whether we get students in upper grades uh, during the course of the year. But generally, we maintain a 480 people population. Do you charge tuition? We charge tuition of $3,400 a year. And is it a religious school? It is a religious-based school. And um, I think the, the, the thing, you know, when you say religious school, it is interesting that from a political perspective, people think that what you're doing is proselytizing and teaching religion. But we teach math and science and literature and all those, all the courses. We even teach Spanish as a second language so that every child graduating there already has a proficiency in that second language. And we've been able to do well since 82. 99% um, of our kids have graduated, and we have... Um, um, what percentage? 99%. 99%. We've only lost one kid that we know of. And um, when you look at the study that was done recently by the New York Times, our kids are passing 85 to 96%. Uh, for the standardized test in math and reading and, and science. And these are all kids from the, from the community. community in Jamaica, Queens. That's right. We don't test them in, so it's open enrollment, and uh, they're able to come and, and do very, very well. And they're mostly the children of the parishioners? No, no. no? Actually, my base population is less than 15% of the parishioners, so these are just young people where there are parents who have an interest in getting their children in education and are willing to make the sacrifices to uh, assure that they get it. Have you had a chance to trace them to see how many go on to college and uh, how they do in college? All of our college eligible young people have gone to college and they've graduated. So we've done extremely well in tracking and uh, have come to realize that we're doing a pretty good job in preparing them for uh, their college education. Now, how do the kids from your school compared with the kids from the neighborhood schools where you are? Well, when you look at the neighborhood schools, if you go six blocks from Allen School, it's IS-8, uh, which generally is on the low performing list. It came off this year, one of the worst performing schools. And then you go three blocks from there, uh, there is PS-40, which is currently on the worst performing list. So the reality is that uh, from that same base population, we're able to take those kids and do a, a very good job. As a matter of fact, we've even had kids who were diagnosed for special education in public schools, and we've allowed them to come in. And, and once they come in that school, they put on a uniform, they understand it's a disciplined environment, they know that there are standards and high levels of expectancy, those kids are able to perform so that they had been misdiagnosed because they may have been behavioral problems, but they were not educational or intellectual problems. 
So what, what is the reason why your kids do better in your opinion? Oh, I, th I think it's in part because there is a, a sense on the part of those who are teaching there, uh, people who don't have to be there. Generally, they're teachers who could get a job outside of that environment. But these are all accredited teachers. These are pro most yeah. of them are, and they could be teaching anywhere. I have even master degrees teachers. Um, but the difference is the high level of expectancy, the demand on parents. If a ch child does not show up on time with homework, that parent gets a call that day. They know that they have to stop by that office that afternoon or in the morning. They cannot bring that child back without having some discussion with that teacher. And we give them so much homework that it's almost impossible for parents not to be involved in the educational process. And it makes a big difference. Now, you only charge 3400 uh, Right, tuition. right. Uh, what's the class size? Class size is generally we try to top at 24. Mm -hmm. Every now and then we'll go over if it's in an upper grade, seventh, eighth grade, for instance, where there's a parent who feels they really need to get a kid in and we may take that child. And generally we find that uh, the size of the classroom is a factor, but in reality it is the attitude of teachers that makes the big difference in terms of whether you educate. Well, my wife is a public school teacher right. in Manhattan and she teaches the seventh grade, she teaches English, and she has 37 kids in her class, so she deals with 150 students every day. Mm. Now, how are you able to keep the class size down to 24 or so, uh, when you, you only charge 3,400 tuition, and the average uh, tuition uh, in uh, New York City, we have $9 billion and a million students, it's $9,000 a child. Yeah. Do yeah. you pay less to the teachers? We pay less than our teachers actually make less, but they stay with us. I mean, they go, we don't have that much of a turnover. Usually when we lose a teacher, it is to the public system, and it is because they pay more. And, for instance, if you have a father who is uh, a teacher there, generally they are not making enough to take care of the responsibilities of family, and therefore they may leave. But generally the teachers are stuck with us. Uh, they are committed to the school. You pay much and less. To the or, I would not say much. Our starting salaries are about 18, and we go up to about I think 30 for the top of the scale. So it's um, it's not it's it's significantly it's about a third less than what the public school pays. Now I was interested in your special education uh, analysis because we found remember I made an analysis of the school system some years ago that uh, special education, full-time special education, cost over $23,000 per right, student per right, year, right. which is more than private schools, and uh, nobody ever gets out of special that's education. That's right. I think that's a, I think that's a travesty. Yeah. I mean, when you look at how, who we put in special ed and the fact that it does not seem to be designed in a way to allow those students to come out. And of course, even if you put a kid in special ed, say if they're age 10, at the age of 14, you can't put them back into a class with 10-year-olds because they will feel their self-esteem will be low, and so you don't have any way of trying to move them through the system. They are many of the young people who wind up making the prison population because they've been separated from the population. They don't have education. They go to the streets. They commit acts of crime, and they do many other foolish things, uh, which ultimately means we're going to pay for them one way or the other. We ought to invest in education rather than in jails. Well, as you know, uh, I've been opposing social promotion in the uh, K-12 system for many, many years and have not been successful in doing it. Why, what do you think is the reluctance of the uh, Board of Education and the Chancellor to move to change, especially in view of the five, fact that uh, uh, ministers like you and have been doing uh, uh, an excellent job in different communities throughout the city? I, I think social promotion, there, there are those who came with these theories in the 70s and 80s about um, the kind of stigma that you place on children. I think the greatest stigma comes when they go through a system and then find they don't have the kind of education to put them in the position to be competitive, to get the kind of job they want, or even to go on to graduate school or to pass a civil service exam. The reality is that I think the stigma is relatively limited in comparison to what happens later in life if you don't give them a quality education. I think social promotion can be paralyzing to a student and therefore ought to be removed so that that child can have the best opportunity 
to take care of the responsibilities of adulthood and family well, once they go through the I was system. interested in what you said about your experience at Boston University, that you got students who came from areas uh, such as uh, the one you're in in Queens and areas like the South Bronx, and that they, even though they had a high school diploma, they were not up to college level work, because that's exactly the problem that we now have at the City University. Yeah, I think what, and what we did at BU, we used some of the TRIO programs under the old federal TRIO program, set up skills banks. Uh, they still do some remediation. I don't think it's to the magnitude that you do in City University. Um, I think, though, when you look at the whole notion of remediation, we can't just start from the perspective of higher education, just like we can't start from that perspective as we address education as a whole. We've got to address the reality that the public system is now, not now, producing young people that are able to go into those institutions and be competitive without some remediation. So we have to design systems that are not necessarily a part of the institution that gives them an opportunity for it so that they can f move into that system and not cause the system to have to retract from its historical mission of giving the best quality education to every child and spending a great deal of its resources on remediation. Well, that's what we're trying to do. We've developed a program known as College Now, mm -hmm. uh, which starts working with the young people when they are in high school, right. eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth grade, so that when they get to the city university, they will not uh, require remediation, because mm -hmm. obviously it's not only a waste of, uh, of uh, money, but more importantly, it's a waste of the young people's lives if they have to begin to get, in effect, a high school diploma after they left high school. Mm -hmm. But extending it to all of the uh, um, high schools in the city is a difficulty. We can't get the uh, necessary approval to do it on a system-wide basis. Kind of the problem that I think both of us had in Congress. We can get a pilot program approved, but we can't do it on a system-wide basis. Uh, yeah, yeah, the forces that, that lobby against uh, yeah, change yeah, yeah. generally yeah. will respond to anything that upsets their status quo. And I think whether, whether it is in Congress, whether it's in city council, or whether it's boards of education, once you get into a comfort zone, there seems to be a reluctance to bring about change, even if they have to confess that it is for the better. Yeah, and they will say uh, it was a good idea, and we would like to expand it, but in fact uh, what happens is it never happens. Yeah, it never gets expanded. And the problem with pilot programs is you don't create a base of enough data to do a comparative measurement that allows you to be able to say, if you try this system, then this system will work. Uh, because if you have limited it so narrowly, you could always argue that if we had the same kind of limited population base to deal with, then we could get the same results. So our reality is that we work on this pilot model because it does not create a major competitive factor against the, the, the kind of systems that are already in place. Right, right. We'll be back after this announcement. There is a in Salisbury, Maryland, the hungry are being fed. In Wind Falls, Indiana, a man who learned to read at 47 is making sure others learn earlier. Every day, someone in America is doing something to light up another life. But there is so much more to do. The light to do it is within us all. We only need to share it. Our guest today is the Reverend Dr. Floyd Flake, who is the senior pastor of the Allen African Methodist Episcopal Church in Queens. And we have been talking about uh, the uh, school that he has uh, in, his, uh, in his parish. But you also have been one of the leaders in the charter school movement. Um, how do you stand on that? Well, I, I think charter schools represent a possibility for creating the kind of educational environments that we had assumed public education in general would be able to, to create. Um, I think that given the conditions of most of the urban schools and the kind of young people that are coming out, we have a responsibility to them uh, to try to create alternatives and choice and I think charters represent a very positive choice because you're looking at a system uh, where you can take management that is localized, 
with administrators, teachers, uh, and parents in such a way that it meets the needs of that particular population. Now, you're working now on setting up a charter school, I right? didn't have a charter school and, by and September 2000. And where would that be? Uh, my hope is that, uh, of course, with the help of you and members of CUNY, that we'd be able to present a, a, a proposal to do it on the campus of York College in Queens because I think that would solve a multiplicity of problems. Uh, what kind of charter school would it be? What grade well, level? Well, I, I, on the w one level, I think there needs to be a focus on high school, but then I, I'm convinced that maybe the best route would be from first grade through 12th grade because mm -hmm. if you build up the foundation and take those kids through high school right into college, I think there are great possibilities of being able to have a population of young people who can demonstrate that if given opportunities with standards, with high expectancy, uh, they can learn. But also, for the college sake, what you do is open opportunities right. for work-study programs for the students on the campus, for the education component within that university to be involved uh, in having an experimental uh, basis by which it can do its own analysis of what's best in terms of teaching urban kids. Well, I think with the experience you've had with your uh, school, that it probably would be better. I would think it'd be better if you st had started at the first grade and went K through 12 and then tied it in with uh, your college. Um, but a lot of people have heard about charter schools, but they don't really understand how this comes about. What is the planning process? How many students are you uh, talking about? Yeah, well, you can do a number of arrangements. One arrangement has about 250 students, which puts you below the threshold where you have to have, un where you have to have unions. Uh, there's a, uh, there are about 10 uh, what they're going to call super schools, which has populations of about 1,000. Uh, I would be looking to do a super school because mm -hmm. I think that uh, when you look at the conditions of that community, you have a lot of people who are looking for a way to get good So you would have students. to have regular teachers in your We'd school? We'd have to have regular teachers, mm -hmm. and I have no problems with that. As long as there are, uh, there are understandings with the unions and with others that this institution has a purpose and a goal and that we have to make some kind of negotiated arrangements of how we're going to teach, who has responsibility for teachers, and who has responsibility even for the building. Because you don't want a building that closes at 3 o'clock. Mm -hmm. You're talking about its extended days and probably an extended year if you're going to be serious about trying to educate. And that would be my objective and that would be the goal uh, that I think is attainable if we do it on the campus. Well, Randy Weingarten has been on this program and she has said she doesn't object to charter schools so long as the, uh, the regular teachers and they get the regular benefits. She and I have talked about that and she has indicated that we may be able to do a school together. And I think that with the best of all worlds is to have one in which you have some relationship with unions so that they understand that this is not an anti-union move. This is a move to try to better the quality of education for the children. And I think if everybody has that interest, ultimately we will have the kind of schools that I think we deserve and I think that, that, that the Constitution mandated. Would the high school that you would develop uh, and tie into your college, if we can do that, would that have a specialty of any kind at all? I'm not sure we'd do a specialty. I, I think that uh, there are many entities who are interested in doing specialty schools. Mm -hmm. I think I'd focus on academics because I think that's the weak area. And, and uh, we need to prepare some future PhDs and some future mathematicians and so forth. And I think we need to pr place our emphasis there. Well, you're going already beyond your college. You're going now to the graduate school, well, which send, is good. Send them right up here to that's, the grad school. And, that's, uh, that's and I think that's the way it ought to work. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, this is a city that ought to be a model for every city in the world. We have all of the access to the technical resources that the rest of the world may not even have or heard about yet. Right. And we need to take full advantage of it. And I think we could do it that way. Now, the other movement that has um, developed in the past uh, uh, few months in New York City is the voucher movement. What's yeah. your position on that? Well, I support vouchers. I think, again, you create as many alternatives as possible so that parents uh, know that if they can't, for instance, get a child in a, char in a charter school, they at least have another alternative. And I think once you begin to create all of these alternatives, the public school 
finds itself having to compete for students, I think that it will do a better job. I'm not anti-public education. I am pro-public education that is of the highest quality and where there's equality within the system for every child, regardless of their ethnic or any other kind of background. And I think we can create that kind of competition that makes them understand that reform is not something you put off well into the next century after you've lost another generation of children, but that if they're going to do reform, they have to do it now or they will be competing for the children that they historically have been able to get the state dollars for. Now they will compete with other entities that are also eligible to receive those dollars and hopefully they'll do a better job. Why do you suppose that the opposition to vouchers has been so violent to the extent that Chancellor Crewe has even said that he would resign if vouchers were approved? Yeah, I, I think that's um, uh, one of those areas where there's a great deal of uncertainty but I think more importantly, it is an area where there's a feeling that given much of the feeling on the part of urban parents, that they would opt out as opposed to stay in. And so I think as a chancellor, his position has to be to support the existing system and the status quo. Both of us, though, from the position where we are, cannot afford to accept that simply because we know what the responsibility is to those students, and those responsibilities are not being met within the current status quo. And we know that they've had uh, voucher programs, for example, in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And really, the, the, nobody is suggesting that vouchers would expand to the extent that they would threaten the public school system. Yeah, I don't think they destroy the system. I think they create an environment where, through competition, you can actually see a system that plans for and works for developing young people that it knows are competitive because they've had to compete to get those young people. Just like we do at higher education. Mm -hmm. I always find it fascinating that, that we open the doors wide in higher education, but we don't create the environment that allows us to be able to get kids to higher education. And I think that's where we have to focus our attention. Let's talk about the education uh, problem on a nationwide basis because both of us have served in the Congress of the United States and we now have a president, President Clinton, who says that he is the education president. The uh, top candidate for president in the Republican Party, George Bush, has made education uh, his platform. Governor Pataki has said that he is the education governor and, and Mayor Giuliani talks about education being so important. Um, if everyone concedes that education is the key to uh, opportunity in this country, why is it that we have so little support for educational programs out of Washington? Well, I, I think one of the things you and I both know, having been in Congress, is the devil is always in the details. So it's not what you say publicly, it's actually what you put into a package, what you put into a political uh, process. And if that process does not indicate a support for what you are verbalizing, then in reality you cannot put your, you cannot consider yourself as being a primary proponent of that issue. If the programs that are coming out of Washington, as I know they are since I've had some debates with the Secretary of Education, uh, primarily talk about uh, more money to build schools, and that's an, that's a laudable goal. But just building schools alone will not answer the problem if you don't solve the problem of social promotions, you don't solve the problem of raising standards, you don't solve the problem of trying to raise the level of young people to the point where they know they have the capability to perform. Well, I think the president said in one of his speeches that he was going to uh, limit educational aid uh, only to communities which agreed to eliminate social promotion. Uh, would, wouldn't that uh, I think help that's a the forward problem? step. I think that's a forward step. Uh, but it, it in and of itself does not solve the problem either. I mean, you, you have to look at how you raise the standards uh, so that the students understand that you don't get social promotions, but also that teachers understand that you ought to be teaching not to a limited low curve, but you teach to the highest standard possible. Because if you don't do that, you still will have a lot of kids who will drop out of the system uh, because they didn't get promoted. 
So you have to make sure that throughout that system, there's an understanding that the primary focus is on educating every child by whatever means necessary. Now, I think we would agree that Head Start has been a successful program. It's been a very successful program. program. And Title I as well. Title I has been successful. Now, if, if you could, how would you expand educational progr programs in Washington? If I could, I'd expand educational programs by putting uh, a focus on particularly urban schools and rural schools that suffer more greatly than suburban schools. Try to use the federal dollars to equalize the resources that are going into those areas and then place heavy demands on the performance ratio for student failure and student success. And I think that that can be done because the Department of Education has billions of dollars it can, and when you control the dollars you wield a lot of power and they can utilize that power better uh, by not bowing down to pressure but rather saying our goal is to create an educated society and we cannot do that unless we make these kind of Now you say you've been having conversations with the Secretary of Education in Washington. Well we had debates. <laughs> debates. Well do you think he's going to move in the direction you No I see? don't. I don't see it. I don't, I don't see a lot of creativity and flexibility in the governmental process uh, as it relates to the uh, Department of Education and hey, you and I both having served in politics know that that process takes a long time to meander uh, through the system and I don't know that we'll see that in the immediate future unfortunately. Yes and the struggle will continue. Thank yes. you for being here today. Thank you. You can reach us by email at our website, www.cunytv.cuny.edu, to let us know what you think, or write to us at CUNY TV, 25 West 43rd Street, Suite 1220, New York, New York, 10036.